This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 52. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak, brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com, your spot on the internet for the best comic book and entertainment related columns, contests, features, reviews, news, resources, and more. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Kevin Moyer. I'm Jamie D. I'm Peter Rios. We are sexy bitches, yeah! <laughs> and welcome to another exciting episode of Comic Geek Speak. You know, we're two ep- episodes away from 50. We might have to come up with something else for that sexy bitches. I don't know. I'm starting to, you know, starting to feel like we need something else. All right, else. well, we'll Mr. Mr. I have all the free time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> not Find to say that I'm not a still a sexy Find bitch, it. because I'm the sexiest bitch of all. But. Yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> or the bitchy is sexy, or whatever. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I need the mirrors out of the room. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of feeling, you know. Heading to 100. I can taste it. 100. We just got done with 50, and he's already salivating over 100. Well, at the rate we're going, we're, we're going to like record weeks. 50, uh, 100 in like, you know, a week, two weeks from now. Well, we have another uh, exciting episode. Uh, we are about to pick up the phone and call Michael Lark, the newly announced artist on Daredevil, with, along with Ed Brubaker writing the book. And, of course, that's very exciting for especially Kevin and I, as we are huge Daredevil fans. And, Michael, uh, Mike I think Kevin just soiled his trousers. <laughs> uh, that's why I, yep. I wore two pair of shorts. <laughs> we had Mike Norton, Michael Lark. Next week's Mike W. Barr. The week after that will be Mike Barron. We're going to just do all the mics. <laughs> mics. All the mics. Well, let's see if he uh, answers his phone. That would be a plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll shoot this Hopefully episode right to hell. Usually it won't uh, stand us up. <laughs> I've been a fan of this guy's art for a long time. Oh, it's ringing. One ringy dingy. <laughs> What's that from? I don't remember. <laughs> laughing. <laughs> laughing. Was it? Hello? Lily Hello, Mike. Yeah. Hi, Mike. It's uh, Brian Deemer here at Comic Geek Speak. Yeah, hi. Welcome to the show. We're actually already recording. We're actually already recording. Yes, we, we, oh, even, well. we even recorded your phone ringing. Well, wow, that's great. Well, you know, your listeners will be thrilled to hear that the battery on my phone looks to be running low, so if I disappear, that's why. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't take it personally, then. <laughs> no, don't. Um, well, then, uh, let's ask the first question we always ask is, how did you first get into comic books? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I was actually late in the, in the comic books. Um, I didn't start reading them, really, until I was in college. When I was a kid... I had a few comic books here and there, but I, I never really got into them that much. And you know, part of it might have just been that my parents didn't buy me comics that often. But I know that part of it was also that I just I never really liked the art in comics. Um, you know, the first comic book that I remember buying that I actually liked the art in was the uh, the adaptation of Empire Strikes Back that was drawn by Al Williamson in around 1980. So. Um, you know, and then after that, I started getting into it in, co- in college because there was the whole black and white boom of the '80s that kind of drew me in. Cool. Um, well, let's in in the in, in case we lose you, let's skip right to some really meaty questions here. <laughs> okay. um, you've just been recently announced as the new artist on Daredevil, uh, and uh, um, in a previous interview, actually, with an interview that you gave to Chris, our roving reporter in Chicago at the convention. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Alex Malev uh, was one of your favorite artists and an inspiration. Uh, in in what way does he inspire your work? Oh, I you know I get inspired by a lot of different artists, and you know there's different different reasons for you know every different book that I see. Alex, I just like I like seeing somebody who pushes boundaries with his own art. Uh, I like seeing somebody who. Um, who, he's continuously challenging himself to try new things, and I mean, if you look at his entire run on the series, you can see, and, and especially if you look at all the things he's ever done, that he never really just settles down into one particular thing. Uh, he keeps trying new things, he keeps trying different ways to get the story across, and and really, he doesn't, he's not satisfied to just uh, churn out, you know, pale imitations of, you know, something that somebody was doing, you know, 15 years ago which is a lot of, I think, 
unfortunately what we see on the shelves today. Yeah. Uh, as a follow-up to that, how will how will your Daredevil depictions differ from Alex's? Now, we've seen one, I guess, promotional piece where you, you've drawn Daredevil kind of swinging through the skyline. And, and at first glance, you know, to the untrained eye, you might say, oh, it's an Alex Daredevil. But then you realize that, no, it's not. It's a it's a Michael Lark. So, so how how are you going to differ from from Alex's drawing? Oh uh, well, you know we have different styles, I and mean, we're you know he and I, and you know there's a couple other people like Sean Phillips and Michael Gatos, all kind of have a lot of the same influences, and we're into the same kinds of artists, and we like to do the same kinds of things with our art. So you know, there are going to be similarities there. You know, I'm, I'm going to be going for the same kind of gritty realism that, that Alex goes for. Um, so, I mean, really, I just think that any differences you see are just going to be differences in the way that he and I draw more than anything. I also think that um, me and Ed, you know, would kind of like to bring a little bit more of kind of the, the widescreen action approach to the book. Um, Brian and, and Alex have been doing some very personal stories, and I'm, I'm not knocking them at all because I love that book. It's one of the few comics I read every month, um, and that I make a point of buying. But I think that Ed and I want to kind of get some more swashbuckling action in there, and kind of combine that old school Daredevil with a little bit of what they've been doing, you know, a little bit of what Frank Miller did, and just kind of, you know, like Ed's done with Captain America, where he's taken kind of all the different approaches to Cap and he's kind of tying them all together and making them all work together and making them all seem part of a unified whole and I, I'm i expecting that he's going to do the same thing with Daredevil and that that will give me a lot of room to stress as an artist to where it won't just be um, you know kind of the street level kind of um, realism that Alex shows with his stuff I think that's one of the things that I've noticed um, when you did the what if uh, Karen Page had lived story um, that I was looking at uh, while I was reading that story and admiring your artwork on that story that uh, your art had more of that dramatic feel to it, the more uh, dramatic style to it. Your storytelling was different. Even though, the, your, like, again, your art is similar to like Alex and, and Michael Gatos and, and it's interesting that you mentioned your your first influence on comics was Al Williamson because that was kind of a similar, you know, type of style as well as like John Romita Jr. and such. But uh, I think that's where I noticed the most is is that even though you have a similar style uh, that reflects what has been on the book for the past five years, there is dif- uh, definitely a difference, I think, in the the dramatism in your storytelling and such and your, and yeah. your characters as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely going to be coming more from you know, the David Mazzucchelli, Alex Maleev school of approaching Daredevil than, say, the Joe Quesada school. Um, you know, Joe, Joe was doing a superhero book, and, you know, he, he's great at that. He's amazing at that. I'm not. So, um, you know, it's, gonna, it, it's still going to have that element of realism to it, I hope. Um, but I kind of like to, I kind of like my superheroes to be a little more iconic and not quite as real as what Alex is doing. I, I like them to be kind of separate from our, our reality, from our day-to-day reality. That was one of the things that I, I really enjoyed about working on Gotham Central was that, you know, I could have these real people that would come in contact with the Joker. And, I mean, how freaky would that be if you came in contact with the Joker? I mean, you, you might see an Alex Ross painting of real people coming in contact with the Joker, and it looks like real people talking to a guy wearing makeup. And, you know, my, my approach, I wanted it to look like people talking to this guy who is this deformed freak. And, um, you know, didn't want to make him cartoony deformed, but still, you know, kind of keep that same look that he would have, you know, if more cartoony artists were drawing him and just kind of make it all work together. And that's what I'm looking forward to doing with Daredevil. Like, you know, I want Kingpin to go back to being this, you know, this huge guy that, you know, looks like he probably couldn't even support his own weight, as opposed to Alex just kind of trimmed him down and made him look like just a big guy, you know, and once, once again, there's nothing wrong with what Alex is doing, I think that he and Brian are doing, you know, just probably my favorite run on that series ever, um, it's, I just think that, 
you know, I, I like to take some of the older stuff that went on with it and not necessarily throw it out the window and see if we can incorporate it into what we're doing. It sounds like um, for those few people out there who during the Bendis run on Daredevil have said you know things like they wish there was more action, they wish there was some more superheroes, he, super heroics going on. It sounds like we're we're going to get a little a little more of that. Not that that's the main focus. Um, is uh, as you say, you know, making him a little more swashbuckling. Um, so I, that sounds like it's going to appeal to those people who might have had those little critiques about the Bendis run. Well, once again, I think you know I'm. I'm so lucky that I'm going to be working with Ed um, with Brubaker. He's, you know, he's shown, you know, Ed just amazes me. He's, you know, if not, he's he's definitely one of the best writers in comics. You know, if not in my opinion, the best. And he's shown that he can work in almost any genre and do it well. And Captain America especially has shown that he can he can step in with these, you know, these guys who have had these long lives and so many different interpretations of them and kind of make them all work together in a story that can appeal to all the different fans. And it's kind of like what Bruce Timm did with the uh, the first Batman animated series where he took all the different ideas of Batman and made them work together as one. And I think that's really kind of brought the same sensibility to Captain America. And and I really, I, I from what he's told me so far of what he wants to do with the first year or two of, of of our run on Daredevil, it's going to be kind of the same, the same approach. It's not going to be the same book as Captain America by any stretch of the imagination, but that same kind of okay, let's take all these loose ends and tie them all together. We've got, we've got several different ideas for little, little things that have been dropped here and there in the past of the series that have never necessarily been completely resolved that we're going to, we're going to address, you know, in our first two years. So, um, and that, you know, that's going to include the Bendis run. There's, there's been things on the Bendis Believe run that. Um, that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna bring back and, and tie up together and things like that. So it, I think we're gonna appeal to all the fans. I, I really hope that the Bendis fans will stick with us, and that you know the people who, for whatever reason, have been poo pooing his stuff, are gonna gonna come back too. I mean, for myself, I can speak. <clears throat> excuse me, and 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 reflect that I feel you know, to, especially listening to you now and what I've heard since uh, the announcement has been made that you are. Taking the next step, you're adding on. You're, you're, you know, you're stepping to the next level as far as from what Bendis and Malev have done. You know, you're not, you're not doing a uh, an exact duplication or trying to mimic what they have done. You're taking it to what, you know, your art is doing. What you feel is important and strong with the character, as well as uh, you know, Brubaker's style of, like you said, tying together uh, lots of continuity and still keeping it exciting and fresh and adding to that. And that really enthuses me about your run in, with Brubaker on this book. I mean, and Mazzuchelli was always one of my favorite Daredevil artists, and I think his realistic style is what really drew, drew me in. So I can see that reflection in your style as well. And, and if that's where your um, intention is set for that, then I am definitely uh, more so enthused to, to see your run begin. Yeah, we're really, we're really excited about it. I think, you know, and, and what you say is, is true. I mean, it also, though... Our our first story arc is gonna is gonna pick up um, from a cliffhanger that Bendis is gonna leave us. Um, he he had been wanting to do this particular cliffhanger and was thinking in his own mind when he knew he was gonna quit. He was thinking, oh, I can't do that to the next writer. You know, that would be terrible. I you know that no writer would want to be stuck with that. And so he kind of put it out of his head. And Ed and I have been talking about some ideas and. Um, we had actually decided maybe we were going to do the exact same thing to him, like further on in our run in the series. And Ed was telling Brian about it, and so you know Brian thought about it and called Ed back a, a couple days later, and he was like, you know, I'd kind of been thinking the same thing. What if we did this? And um, so it's going to take it's going to pick up from where they left off, but it's not going to. We're not interested in imitating Alex and Brian. I mean, they're friends of ours, and we both love their work, but you know. We've been wanting to work on Daredevil together since before Brian and Alex were working on it. So this is this is not about okay, we're going to be the next Brian and Alex. This is you know we both love Daredevil and we want to do our take on Daredevil. Great. Now, is this something you had to lobby to get for this job, or was this something that was offered to you? you no. Know, um, I think that I think that maybe Joe has 
thought I had to lobby to get me to do it. I think Joe wanted me to do it, and Brian also had been, you know, Brian and I have known each other since we started out in Caliber uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and we've always wanted to work together, and Brian, I think, had been kind of lobbying for me to do it, and Joe had noticed my work in the past, and in fact, they had talked to me several years ago about possibly, um, you know, helping out a little bit doing fill-ins here and there on the book, but I had just started on Gotham Central and couldn't do it. Um, so I think this is something they wanted to do for a long time, and, you know, Ed chose to no longer be exclusive with DC, and right after that, I was starting to think some of the same things about, you know, possibly ending my exclusive with them and, and doing some different things, and it all just kind of fell into place as far as they were concerned. But I, I didn't, they, they offered me the exclusive, I think, with this in mind. Um, they wanted to try me out first and see how I do on some superhero stuff that was different from anything I'd done in DC, and they were pleased with the work, both for me and Ed. And, you know, I think that as early as probably last January, they were, they were pretty set on what they wanted to do, and, you know, we didn't have to fight for it very hard at all. It was, it was kind of a done deal. Awesome. Um, can you just allow me one moment of ass kissing and say that I just recently got done reading the uh, Captain America hardcover that just came out, oh, and, and, great. and your work on that is absolutely stunning. Oh, thanks. You know, I, I'm so thrilled to be a part of that team. I'm actually working on on some more flashback stuff right now. I mean, as we speak, I'm working on a page. Um, <laughs> Excellent. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing some more flashback stuff for uh, starting with issue 12, I believe. Um, and I'm, I just love being part of that team. Those guys are just knocking the ball out of the park with every issue, and it's just, it's, it, I won't say it's easy work, because for me, with what I'm doing with that book, there's a lot of research involved, but that's the kind of stuff I like doing. I, I, it's hard work, but I, I enjoy doing it, and so it's just been, you know, it's just a thrill to have my work sitting in there, you know, with Ed's, you know, dialogue on it, and Steve's work next to mine, who I think is a great artist. And Frank Darmont just does an amazing job coloring every page. So it's just a thrill to be part of that team. So thanks. That is a, a question I, I was going to ask you. Was It looked like all your flashback sequences were very detailed, and I was wondering if you had done a lot of research about what the tanks look like, what the uniforms look like, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, probably not as much as I should. But, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you only have a certain amount of time with a comic book. I, I spent more time on issue five than I should have, um, you know, doing a lot of research on tanks and, you know, what a camp would look like, what a, what a, what an allied or a Soviet camp would look like in that, you know, part of the, the Russian front and stuff, which, you know, I probably spent way too much time doing that. Um, but at the same time, probably not as much as I would have wanted to. And I found a lot of details that I wasn't able to put in. Um, there were just little things like, oh, I want to draw that. That'd be cool. And there just wasn't room for it. But, yeah, I, I do research on pretty much everything I do like that. I mean, I... I sat for, you know, I spent a week watching, you know, every episode that was available at the time of Homicide when I was working on Gotham Central. So I, I tend to throw myself into a project that way. It's cool. Well, it definitely shows. Thanks. Uh, this, this is Jamie. Uh, I just wanted to kiss your ass a little bit myself. Okay. Um, I've, I've actually been following you since uh, Terminal City, the first, uh, the first incarnation of that. And it, was there anything before that or was that your first work? Oh, no, I've done, um, I started out at Caliber, like I said, back in the, oh, my gosh. I think my first thing was published in 91, maybe. What I was that? I can't remember, to be honest. I don't have any copies of it around. I, I don't ever want to see them again. Okay. <laughs> They're, you know, it was a kid who, I mean, it was my first comic I ever drew, and it got published. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, well, I wasn't even that much of a kid. I was embarrassingly old for how, how bad I was. But, um... You know, I, I was learning as I went, and um, I made a lot of mistakes, so it's kind of hard to see. And then after, I, I wrote and drew my own book called Airwaves there. Okay. And I worked at just doing art chores on some other projects, various projects here and there at Caliber for a couple of years. And then I was contacted by uh, Dean Motter, who wrote Terminal City. At the time, he was um, an art director for Byron Price Visual Publications. Mm-hmm. And they asked me to do a, a graphic novel adaptation of a Raymond Chandler book called The Little Sister. Okay. And 
um, that was my first professional job, and it took about a year to do that. And um, but that didn't get published until after Terminal City started coming out. Uh, uh, my relationship with Dean led to me getting the job doing Terminal City when he pitched that at DC. He asked for me to do the art on that. That's cool because that's that was one of the things that that really brought me to the book was the the artwork. I really thought it was great, and I've I've been tooting your horn ever since. I've been uh, anytime people talk about artists and especially underrated artists, as far as I I'm concerned, I I always uh, tell them look for your stuff. So. Well, I hope the underrated part's going to change when I start doing Daredevil. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that, and uh, well, hey, this entire room, they were like, oh, Michael Lark's going to do Daredevil. Who's he? And I was like, well, he did yeah. this, he did, he did this, he did Excuse that, he did me? this. Well, <laughs> some of you, some well, you of know you what did. happened as soon as I signed with Marvel? I, you know, the, the week after I signed, I was more popular drawing nothing than I had been for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Did you make Wizards' no. top list? Pardon me? Did you make Wizards' top list and you just signed and you hadn't even drawn anything yet? I don't know if I did that. I don't know if I'll ever make Wizards' top list, but, um, you know, that... Yeah, it was, you know, it was funny that, that all these people were suddenly talking about me who had no idea who I was. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, hey, I, I've been here for 10 or 15 years, guys. <laughs> you're that 20-year you're that overnight sensation. Yeah, that, well, you know, I, I, I'd been in the business for about six or seven years and got nominated for Best Newcomer for an Eisner. And then they found out that I'd been in the business for seven years and took the, the nomination away. <laughs> oh, that oh, sucks. Right. That's a ripoff. We'll have to give you a no prize for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, uh, I think I know what the Daredevil cliffhanger is. I think you're going to stick. I think uh, Alex Malev is going to stick Daredevil in the movie costume, right? That's it, right? <laughs> That's going to be the cliffhanger. That be, yeah, that would be pretty horrible, though. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, you know, I, I fully intend to model him after Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> That's All right, I, I'm not buying it now. After he, 25 years, I'm not buying Daredevil. <laughs> no, 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 the, cli- the cliffhanger will be. He'll, great actor, come on. No, the cliffhanger will be. Uh, Matt Murdock goes to Ben Affleck's house and beats the shit out of him and gets arrested. <laughs> that would be sweet. Yeah? Okay, now I'm buying it again. I have to ask, um, and this is a... Um, with you being over at Marvel now, I guess we won't see this, but uh, the few things that you did with JSA, um, the, um, and Brian reminded me about the All-Star miniseries, the story you did there, in there, and I saw an image of the JSA online, um... Did that appeal to you at all, that team, because of, of the time period they were in, or is that just pigeonholing too much uh, your style? Um, I think that it was, you know, my love of doing period pieces combined with DC wanting to have somebody who had a little bit more of an old school style as opposed to, you know, have Jim Lee do the cover of the JSA um, archive or something, you know, that, which would kind of, I mean, Jim's a great artist, but it would kind of look odd. Right. Um, I think that's all it is. I mean, to be honest, you know, I I find that team to be um, a little dull at this oh. point, which is, you know, maybe just because I've spent the time at Marvel now and everybody's jumping around in brightly colored tights and, you know, I, I just got finished drawing the Hulk and Spider-Man, who are a lot more exciting than the JSA. <laughs> I saw that cover that you posted on your, uh, your forum on the... Uh, Comic Creators oh, yeah, Board. Uh, yeah, um, that looks am- amazing. Beautiful piece. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, so, I mean, they're, you know, it's a little dry for my taste. And, you know, I find that with a lot of the DC stuff. It, it's just, you know, it, it, the only character that... Re- I like the Vertigo characters, and then I like, you know, a lot of the Batman universe. But those are the only characters that really appealed to me um, when I was there. And, I, you know, I really wanted to work on you know, some more Batman stuff, and I would have loved to. You know, I worked on Starman, or I guess, not Starman. I guess I'm thinking of the the, uh, the JSA thing that Starman was in. But, you know, I kind of like that stuff, but a lot of it just, you know, got so dry to me. And so I think that now I'm just kind of having a reaction to it, and I'm, I'm ready to do some slam-bang Marvel big-screen action, and then I'll probably end up going back to wanting to do, you know, more quiet, dry, conservative, uh, can I like a pendulum. Can I plant a seed in you <laughs> with the fact that with what after seeing your your flashback pieces in Captain America, I remember years ago they put out a second Captain America title called Sentinel Liberty, which was supposedly intended to be a collection of stories of Captain America from his World War II days. And 
I was so looking forward to reading that book, and of course when it came out, it was totally not what it was intended to be, and of course ultimately failed. But would that be something you would be interested in doing if they would approach doing a title like that? Well, um, I mean, first of all, when Ed approached me about helping out on Captain America, well, first of all, when, they told, when Ed told me he was writing Captain America, I thought, what? You know, the guy who wrote Low Life is going to be writing Captain America? How's that going to work? Um, and then when I saw what he was doing, I really liked it. And then when he approached me to help out on it, um, I said, I will, I'd be happy to draw Captain America as long as it's World War II stuff. Uh, I just couldn't imagine myself doing the kind of stuff that Steve Epting is doing. Um, I, I just, I love that World War II stuff. I, I love doing it. I love the period. I like those guys with their pants pulled up higher than their navels. Um, <laughs> I just love all that stuff. It's really, it's really cool to me. And I do too. I'm a, I'm a big World War II buff and, and, and seeing that stuff just really enthralls me and I really... Yeah, well, a lot of the flashbacks, um, like, you know, I did a lot of stuff in one issue, I think it was issue three, it was a lot of stuff about the resistance and the French resistance, and it was just really fun drawing all those little tiny little details, like, you know, it's, you know, cobblestone streets and the art, you know, the Arctic Triumph, which is not a, not a small detail, but <laughs> throwing all those details in is really fun to me, all those period details and stuff, drawing you know, Charles de Gaulle parading down the Champs Elysees. It was, you know, it was fun to do that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I would love to do a book like that. Although I have a feeling that knowing knowing what I like and knowing my attention span, it's something that I might get bored with. Um, you know, within ten issues or so. Um, so, you know, let's not hustle me off a of Daredevil anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, please. Stay, <laughs> stay on Daredevil for a good, you know, two, three, ten years. You know, just keep us, keep us going. Longer. Yeah, I hope it's at least as long as Brian and Alex were on it. Excellent. That's, that's great. That's what we want to hear. Nice. One of our biggest gripes uh, is, is people who, uh, you know, they do these amazing runs of, you know, six or twelve issues, and it's really good and it's really fulfilling, but you just want more. You want the old days of a hundred issues of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby on Fantastic Four. You know, that's... You know what? what when, when we started working on Gotham Central, that was our plan. It was going to be me and Ed and Greg for, you know, as many issues as we could possibly humanly do. And, you know, it just, you know, the marketplace just didn't allow that to happen. And, you know, we'll, we'll be on Daredevil until we just have run out of ideas or they get sick of us and kick us off, one of whichever comes first. Fantastic. If, uh, if like Joe Quesada came to you and said, "What is you know? I'm going to give you a book. You can do it. Uh, you know, you can do it. Any character in the Marvel universe. What would that? Uh, what would that book be? Daredevil. Really? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, uh, you know, <laughs> I would love to draw a Spider-Man book. I got to admit, the, the, the ten-year-old in me would love to draw Spider-Man. And I really had a good time doing the Spider-Man short story, but it would also depend on the writer. I, I begged Ed to, to do a Spider-Man book uh, when he first moved over there, and I said, man, if you do a Spider-Man book, I'm coming with you. Um, Daredevil, though, I think for where I'm at right now artistically, Daredevil's the, the book to do for me. Cool. Um, you know, you, both those guys I love. I, the adult in me loves Daredevil. The kid in me loves Spider-Man. <laughs> I also have a soft spot for the Hulk, I must admit. Wow, and you got to draw him in that Spider-Man Unlimited that's coming out. So you got two of I your did, fa yeah. favorite I mean, characters. Unfortunately, all the action on that took place on a TV screen, so it wasn't as big and huge as I, I was uh, in the Hulk. The cover but looked fantastic. Someday, someday I, I intend to do the Hulk. Cool. And I've already put a bug in Anthony about that, but, you know, we haven't seen the Hulk at Daredevil since Bendis has been on it. So. <laughs> you did the inking in Terminal City. Did you do the ink, your own inking in, um, in the Captain America flashback stuff? Um, I've done all my inking on Cap so far. Um, I, I did have, um, I've had some people helping me out here and there, but mostly Stefano Gaudiano has helped me out here and there, just like in the last half of the Gotham Central run, because I had to keep up with the monthly schedule on that, and um, he helped me out on an issue of The Pulse, and he even assisted me a little bit, uh, just as an assistant on the Spider-Man story. I don't know what the situation is going to be um, for the Daredevil book right now. I'm going to try to ink it myself. Um, it, it doesn't look like it's going to be as time-consuming as Gotham Central was, so I, I should be able to do that. Less characters? Less characters, less panels per page. Um, just, 
you know, things like that. Ed, Ed, has, Ed has really streamlined his storytelling more than he used to be on Gotham Central. And I also, it was kind of a challenge to switch back and forth between Ed and Greg because they, they have different approaches to the way they present a script and the way they like, the way they envision a story being told. So each story arc was kind of a, a, a re, re, re-familiarization with the writer when I had to start working on it. The, re- the reason I ask, um, because your work is, is in Captain America, you know, you're, you're going back to the World War II era, and I'm, I was just looking through your Terminal City area, aerial graffiti, number one. Um, we had uh, Brian Miller from Hi-Fi Design, uh, the colorist, uh, on a couple episodes ago. How do you approach your work in, in regards to coloring? Um, do you leave notes for your colorist? Are there things that, or do you leave it totally up to them? Because your work sometimes hits the, the, the more mood, moody time period kind of things, and with Daredevil it's going to have a certain look. You, I assume you want it to have a certain look. So what kind of um, info do you give out, if any? when they look at a comic book and unfortunately what a lot of editors and creators also don't think about is that the, the process of creating a comic book in my mind should be like a true collaborative effort it, it should be it should be equal input from all the different members of the team you know like a band I mean you know I don't you know I don't want to be the, you know I don't want to be in the band where you know somebody tells everybody else what to play for every song you know I want to be in the band where everybody's got input and you know, the guitar player, you know, writes his own part and stuff like that. So I like the colorist style to, to kind of influence me on what I'm going to do. Like, when I work on Captain America, I know what Frank is capable of with backgrounds and, and how he's going to handle stuff. And it gives me a lot of, um, it relaxes me quite a bit as I work on that book. Because I know that no matter what I do, Frank's going to make it look good. Um, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what's going to happen when we do Daredevil, because I, I don't know yet for sure who's going to be the colorist on it. Um, we've got a couple people that, um, that we've bounced around names, and that I would, I would like to work with all of them. So it's just a matter of who we settle on, and, and different people have different styles. One guy that we're talking about has a real kind of flat, moody style. Um, another guy that we're talking about has a much more rendered style. So it'll just be a matter of, um, you know, what we we kind of agree on work together as a whole team because I've worked with both the colorists and both of them work well over my work and it's, it's just a different it, it comes out as a different feel and we'll just have to decide what works best but I you know I'll give notes about lighting and um, you know, like what time of day and if there's a particular color that I think something should be which is rare uh, very very rare but you know like I just got finished doing a scene in Captain America number nine that's a place in a um in a desert military base in the, in the Southwest. And, you know, I, I told Frank, you know, okay, I want, like, kind of Southwest colors on here. I want to get this kind of mood of, you know, heat and desert across, and, and it's at night. And, and Frank came back with something that was completely different from what I envisioned. And it was one of the rare times where I would I went back to him and said, okay, that wasn't what I had in mind, and I sent him photo reference of the kind of photographs I've been looking at to inspire me. And, and that's more what I do than anything else. I'll send the colorist the photo reference that I used so that they know what I'm thinking. So who is the winner guard? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> winner soldier? I mean the winner soldier, yeah. Don't say anything. I'm, I'm, I was kidding. <laughs> and Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> that son of a bitch. <laughs> um, I have a question for you. If, if God forbid, you stopped working today, what uh, – and somebody went – you know, they wanted to know the quintessential Michael Lark – book, what would you like to be remembered by? Um, Gotham Central, probably. Uh, I'm really proud of that book. Uh, you know, that's, that's the one that I give to my relatives and stuff and say, you know, this is what I do. Because, you know, they, they immediately think I'm, you know, and, you know and, and I'll give them Spider-Man and stuff when that comes out because like, everybody can relate to Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. But Gotham Central is the one that I give to people who don't read comics. And say, this is what I do. See, it's not, you know, it's not goofy. It's, you know, I, I really, I'm not just, you know, a cartoonist. 
artist. I, I, I'm really an artist. That's the one I'm the proudest of. The stories were really good, and I was working with great writers. And the other one that I like giving everybody is um, the Batman graphic novel that I did, Nine Lives. Mm -hmm. um, number one, because it's a hardcover, which is kind of nice. And uh, number two, because I think that was when I really, that was when I started to get comfortable with my own art. Cool. Um, I would turn in a page, and I would not just absolutely hate it and think I sucked. The art, the artist lament that we hear all the time when they, when you give a great piece of artwork and they are not satisfied with it. Oh, I, you know what? That's going to happen every time because you can't you can't do what you see in your head. Mm -hmm. But you know you have to start being realistic about it. And, and the, the way I kind of approach it is like you know a Hall of Fame hitter in baseball is you know getting a hit every you know three out of ten times at bat. Yep. And um, so you know if I like you know. You know, if I like two out of six panels on a page that I think are pretty good, then I'm Hall of Fame material. You know, if you know, if I like you know one panel out of every six, then you know I'm I'm still in the majors, but I'm probably you know more the bench, so I can live with that. You know, it's funny you had you had made mention that um, you had watched a lot of you thrown when you were throwing yourself into Gotham Central, you would watch a lot of Homicide, Life on the Street which is one of my favorite shows of all time. Oh, yeah. And when I started reading and picking up Gotham Central, I came in a little late on it, but when I first started reading it, I was like, damn, this guy was watching Homicide because you had to, you know, you're right, you can, you can put it to the writer too, but the artwork had the pacing of that show, um, and I thought, I thought it was great, and that's been a book that I've been, uh, you know, seeing the heralds of and trying to get people to read that one too. Yeah, um, I, well, I love unfortunately, it. it's really hard to find. DC has been really dragging their feet on putting out the trade paperbacks, which is kind of, kind of one of the one of the factors that, that led to you know led to the creative team's demise. Was just you know, I think that that worked against us in a big way. And and but what you mentioned about stylistically, that was really intentional. If, if you look at the book closely, um, you know, once I once I kind of hit my stride on the art, which was probably about the time we started the Half-A-Life story arc. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that um, I was using a really regimented uh, panel size and a really regimented grid on the page. It was pretty much, um, the individual panels were pretty much the same proportions as the TV screen. You know, I might do a wide pan every now and then or a vertical pan mm -hmm. every now and then, but it was still like, it was like a storyboard more than anything else. And that was very intentional on my part. Yeah, and you know it was also the Alex Toth influence, where you know he he did some stuff like that as he was coming out of animation and did some stories that were pretty much just storyboards, mm -hmm. like the famous court story. It's just a storyboard, and that was really in my in my head as I was working on Gotham Central. Cool. Um, just to jump back with something you said, and also I read an article in it where you mentioned it too. The whole um, putting out trades and trades versus singles. Um, we that's always like a running discussion every other episode on this on this show. Um, care to throw in your thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, and, and this is what I what I always say, and that is, you know, if if Barnes and Noble can sell books and magazines, then comics retailers can sell books and magazines. Um, trade paperbacks are books, comic books are magazines, and you know that's it, it's. I think that the problem has been that um, the retailers and the publishers have been slow to see it that way. Um, you know, I, I know the retailers get frustrated because, you know, you know, if the trade comes out too soon, they can't sell their back issues. Um, you know, something needs to change about that so that that's not a problem for the retailers. Um, I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't know enough about comic book distribution. I don't get into that. I know that as a reader, I see a total difference. I buy the comics to read when it's something that I really can't wait to read. Um, but, I, you know, either give them away or, you know, trade them back to my store or whatever um, so that I can get the trades later because that's what I put up in my bookshelf. Uh, I don't, I don't want to keep a bunch of magazines lying around. You know, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to keep every issue of TV Guide, you know, put it in a Mylar bag. Um, <laughs> so I, I want, I want books. So to me, that's the difference. And, and I like the stores um, that really know seem to be marketing the books that way they have a they have a section off to the side where the trades are there spine out and there's a whole bunch of them 
Um, and then on the other side of the store, they've got their magazine racks filled with comic books. I mean, that's that to me is the way it should be. And I, I can't, I can see that they can both live side by side. And I think it's just going to mean some stretching on the part of some of the people who are the most affected by the financial decisions with that. And I know that's hard for them. And I'm not saying that they're wrong for the way they're doing it. I'm just saying that it, I think that if this life, if this industry is going to have life, that's going to have to happen. Because, I mean, I don't know for sure sales figures, but hasn't it been lately that a lot of times the, the growth in the trade paperback sales is, 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 is stronger than the growth in the, in the single issue sales, uh, just in general so, in the industry? I think that's the case. So it saved books. I mean, there's a couple Marvel books that have been saved by, the, uh, by their uh, trade paperback sales. Pardon me? Sent, well, Sentinel, just recently, uh, there have been a couple books that Marvel has put out that their digest sales, the Runaway was one and two, their digest sales were so good, or their paperback sales were so good, that they're now doing, you know, uh, another volume of them. So, yeah, that, that is. You know, I mean, a book like 100 Bullets, um, you know, didn't, didn't knock everybody's socks off uh, sales-wise until it started coming out as trade. And, um, and, you know, look at the life of, you know, a series like Sandman in trade form. Yeah. You know, it just, it, people just keep buying them. And you can do that with the trades. And I just think that, you know, it's a matter of looking at the big picture and saying, okay, we can put these books out on the shelves and they, they will be out there for as long as we can keep printing them. And, um, you know, that's, that, that I think is the way to do it. I mean, look at these, you know, look at the monthlies as something that comes out and it's disposable. I mean... You know, when we were kids, you bought a comic book and you rolled it up and stuck it in your back pocket. You didn't stick it in a Mylar bag and, you know, never look at it. Of course I did. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, uh, you know what, when I was a kid, and I'm a <laughs> yeah. person, so... Yes, we're, I, there's I, some I, older, I older say, ones in here. Yes. I had a guy come up to me at one of my first cons that I was selling stuff at, and he bought one of my books, and then he said to me very proudly, he said, I'm not even going to read it, and slipped it into the Mylar bag, and I was like... What? You know, I worked my ass off on that. You know, I could have just filled it with blank pages and put a cover on it. And you just still bought it, stuck it in your little bag, and you wouldn't have known the difference. <laughs> you should, you should have taken it. I work hard on those. I want people to read them. That's the right. point of them. Right. You know, I, I don't see want you to just save it somewhere and never look at it. I mean, you know, I treat my comic books terribly. People, people who collect comics would probably be appalled at the way I treat comics. I buy old Alex Tug comics, and I love them. And um, I... Um, I pull the staples out and cut the pages apart and stick them into notebooks. <laughs> a few of us are cringing. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just I look at people, like, on eBay that are selling these post comics that are, like, encased in these blocks of lucite. And, you know, it's like it doesn't even have Alex Toth on the cover. It's like a photo cover. And they're selling them for, like, $75. I'm like, why would I want that? Why would I want a block of lucite with a photo in it? You know, I want to look <laughs> at Alex Toth's cover. I want to thumb through it. I want to study what he's doing, and I want to look at how great Alex Toth was. I don't want to. I don't want to. It's not an investment. If I want to invest in something, I'll invest in stocks. <laughs> no, that'll that'll actually pay off in the end for sure. Um, to go back to the trade thing, um, although, and you didn't say any of this, but this this comes up every now and then where um, they say that the the complete move from singles to trades is where some people think the industry is going to go. As an artist, I can't imagine that's something that you would want to happen. Whereas, w instead of doing 23 pages, you got to now pump out 100 and some pages. And not that that's ever going to happen, but uh, what's your what do you feel about that? Yeah, I feel it's never going to happen too. It's kind of like you know, I, I forget who said it now. I, the name escapes me, but the guy who said you know about in 1963 said, "Oh, guitar music is out. You know, there's <laughs> not going to be any guitar bands anymore." That's that's silly. You know. Uh, they're different things, it's, and they, they require different kinds of storytelling. Um, when Ed and I did Scene of the Crime, we intended for that to be a graphic novel the whole time, and it was a little frustrating to have to do it as single issues and put these kind of false cliffhangers in it. Um, we didn't want to do cliffhangers. Well, to reverse that, though, when we started working on Gotham Central, they wanted us to do it as graphic novels. And we said, no, 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 this is a, this is a cop show on TV. You know, we're going to do monthly it, it doesn't make sense to do to do a graphic novel of this. It's got to have the weekly the feel of a weekly TV series. So there are different kinds of storytelling, and I don't think either of them are ever going to go away. I mean, 
I, I suppose you could argue that they could. I mean, I guess movie serials kind of went away. I mean, they did go away, but they kind of got taken. Their place was taken by TV. So I don't. Th- I don't know. I don't think they're ever going to go away. Um, I, as, an, as an artist, I can I can go both ways. I mean, I. Yeah. You know, I love all the different kinds of, of comic storytelling forms. I'm I'm getting my website designed right now, and my intention when I get my website up and running is to do a. Well, I can't do it daily, but do like a three times a week uh, adventure strip. Um, I love that form. I think that you know that's a storytelling form that has just gotten totally forgotten, and and I want to I want to do it. And um, you know, so I like all the forms. I don't I don't think any one is any better or worse or more sensible than any of the others. Um, I'm going to ask you something else since you're on the since you know you're an artist on the phone and uh, you're exclusive with Marvel now. Um, does that mean, you know, you, you're assigned a book, but then in the contract, are there things that say, like, you know, we also want you to do covers for this, we, we need to do promotional shots for this, and do you think some of that is the reason why some hot exclusive artists are always late with the books that they're supposed to be doing? No. No? Not at all. Um, they've never asked me to do anything, they, and they wouldn't ask anybody to do anything that interfered with um, the schedule of what they're working on. Um, you know, the exclusive contract that I signed with them that doesn't say anything about Daredevil in it. Um, it. What it says is that they will um, guarantee me that they will provide me at least this amount of work, um, provided I can get it all done. You know, either either as much work as I can get done, or you know, a certain you know at least this much from them, depending on whichever comes first. Um, there's no mention of Daredevil. Daredevil is not in my exclusive contract um so you know for instance our plan was for me to start working on daredevil this week um cap is is having some scheduling problems because a it started out behind the eight ball and b um there have been some some personal life issues with different members of the creative team that have kind of interfered a little bit and so you know they called me last week and said you know okay we were going to start daredevil but really need some help on cap right now and we wanted to do some flashback sequences anyway can you step in and help us out on a few issues and you know my response was i'd be happy to but it's going to affect the daredevil schedule and so they sat down all the different editors involved sat down and they worked that out um you know that's one of the nice things about an exclusive is that they'll work that out it's not my problem cool. you know i tell them i tell them here's how much i can get done and they say okay well we'll we'll handle the schedule now what, what? How much can you get done? I mean, what's what? what what's your rate? I mean, a week? How many pages can you get done? You know, if I told you, then they would know. Ah. <laughs> like like a good engineer, you don't tell them exactly how long it takes you to do it. Oh no! Yeah, you know, they they just had me do a rush job that I did really quick, and I'm a little nervous about it now because um, I work some crazy hours getting it done, and I don't intend to work those kind of crazy hours. Uh, Entire time I'm working on Daredevil, and I'm afraid they're going to expect that of me. Okay, cool. Yeah, you just did what eleven pages in, in like a short time span. I thought I saw that on the message board that you. Um, made. a little over a week. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Which is fast for me, um, just because I, I had the pencil and ink it, and that was from that was from the point of me having a script that was um, that I. I mean, that was I had I had somebody helping me out with the breakdowns. I had a friend that helped me out a little bit with the breakdowns, and then. Um, I shoot photo reference for everything, and when I shot the photo reference, it kind of um, forced me to change some of the some of the breakdowns a little bit. And um, so, from from the time I began shooting the photo reference until the time I finished was about a week. And you know, I I think I'm lucky if I can do a monthly, if I can pencil and ink a monthly every month. So that was that was twice as fast as I think I'm lucky. Okay. You know, I, I, I try to average a page a day. Yeah, that's that's probably an industry ballpark that people probably shoot for. I'll put out twenty two pages a month, and there's there's usually about twenty two work days in every month. So. Yeah. Well, Mike, uh, I think we have uh, exhausted our questions. Uh, is there anything uh, you want to throw out there? Anything you want to plug? You know, I, we already have. Yeah, it's just Daredevil. I really <laughs> want to talk about Daredevil. I haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. So. Uh, I mean, that's that's all that's all that's out there. I mean, you know, when the website's up and running, come visit it. But I don't even know what the URL is going to be yet. So, 
I'll put up, I'll have an adventure strip on there when uh, when it comes up. So. Great. Well, I really look forward to that. Send oh, send me an email when you when you uh, have that up so we can tell our audience. Yeah, and I'll, I'll post yeah. it on my forum on the Bendis board. And yeah, come by the forum on the Bendis board and we'll talk shop. We've been doing that. It's fun. Yeah, I've been posting since I saw that you had your thread. I saw when you were posting on Malev's uh, thread, and then I saw you got your own when they when they. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, and I'm gonna have a hard time giving up Alex's because there's nothing I enjoy more than getting on Alex's thread and giving him a hard time. So. <laughs> Being on the king of ass board, you gotta admit. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Can we say that on podcast. I wasn't even sure. Sure, you oh, sure, there's, absolutely. There's no FCC here. You can say whatever the hell you want. <laughs> well, you know, because Brubaker was on Fanboy Radio this weekend, and they almost they almost pulled the plug on him. Uh, he couldn't, he could not stop saying shit. Well, well, they're actually, uh, you know, they actually broadcast on the airwaves and then right. later recorded and released it as a podcast. We're just a podcast, so we can we can say anything. Tell Brubaker he can say whatever he wants yep. on our show. <laughs> he can All say right, shit every word he wants. Well. <laughs> That'd be great. Hey, can you bring back Madcap in Daredevil? I'd love you for it. Even in the background. I don't know what Madcap is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank a- you. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you, Mike. <laughs> Mike Murdoch. That was Mike Murdoch. Yeah, we're bringing back Mike. <laughs> oh, get out. He's going to have that snappy pattern. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for the interview, and uh, we wish you the best of luck, and we really, really look forward to uh, Daredevil. Yep. Thanks, guys. It was fun. So when are we going to see this? Uh, this will be out uh, a week from today. A week? A whole week? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll send an email when it comes out so I can tell friends. Well, you know what? I'll I'll send you an email, and you'll have it sooner. How about that? Well, that sounds great. Cause I, I know a lot of like family members and stuff like that um, went by the site and listened to the one from Chicago. So I had to warn them about the bathroom interview. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'd love to I'd love to know about it. Oh, oh, and that reminds me that that Chris, uh, the guy who did the interview in Chicago, uh, s- says hello. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll keep posting on the board. My my screen name is Kev L, and I do have the. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah I you have posted just the last day or two, right? Yeah, yeah, and I have the I have the Comic Geek Speak and my Moon Knight uh, Yahoo group with my signature for each one. That's yeah, it. you're the Moon Knight guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm the Moon Knight guy. <laughs> yeah. so you, don't you want to draw that book? <laughs> you know, a lot of people suggested. A lot of people thought that that might was a possibility when I signed with Marvel that they were going to have me do. I was, I was, that was, you were one of the guys I was hoping would if they do decide to do an, an ongoing, but I know that when, you know, of course, my prediction was that you were going to be on Daredevil, and, and I'm grateful that you are, because those... Yeah, that was, that was everybody's prediction. They're calling it the worst kept secret in comics, <laughs> the worst kept secret, because none of us said anything. It was just the, the most predicted uh, announcement. Yeah. So. so I'll keep, I'll keep in touch with you on the, on the board, and I'll be there all Thanks. the time, so... All right, well, I will talk to you guys later then. Okay, yep. have a good night. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Excellent. That was fun. That was fun. Yeah, he's a fun guy. Yeah, he uh, is. Great guy to talk to. Do you I mean, know how old he is? He kept making references to, you know, to to his age. I, I don't he know. He doesn't seem that no, old, like doesn't. in pictures or whatever. So yeah. I don't, you know. I mean, I, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, he was talking college during the eighties. Was it college in the eighties? Black and white boom. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing he's okay. in his early thirties. I, I would assume. No, well, no, he would be mid. He would be mid thirties then. Yeah, because he was he college in the eighties. He started and white. in ninety one. He said he was kind of old for the way he was drawing, or something like that. Like he made a reference to that. Like yeah. he was older. So hmm. I, I, I not put that him it's important. Us. But yeah. Yeah. put him on us, Kip. Yeah, he's right, right in our alley. No, you guys are pretty old. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> older than dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and proud of us, fresh young Damn chickens over on this side of the room. I am, I'm the youngest one in the room today. Greenhorn. It's good when Matt's here because then he makes me feel old. You know? <laughs> Sitting in a stroller. Yeah. But no, that was really cool. I've, I've, like I said, I, I've told you that I've told the story on here about seeing him just sitting there. So why are we hearing it again? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing him sitting there, it shows that nobody's going up to him. And it's nice to see now that he's going to be doing something. Well, that's not going to happen people anymore. Will, yeah, yeah, people will appreciate the, what he does. I'm really glad to right. see that. One of the threads that he started on his, his section of the message boards was... Uh, I don't know if he started or somebody else started, but like post your your uh, Michael Lark sketches that you know these people have been going up right. to him and and so these sketches are just beautiful stuff that he's just you know putting out at conventions. So I don't think that's going to be a problem for him in the near future um, with the added attention and now um, seeing stuff like that, people mm-hmm. seeing what he does. Yeah. I mean, it's just nice stuff. And and it's everybody had the same thing to say about him, and you can definitely hear it from the reflection of the interview is that he's just a very nice uh, you know grounded 
personable guy, approachable guy. He's more than willing to talk to anybody and, and really loves what he's doing, and it shows. Oh, well, you know, we should have asked him is if he's going to any, like, conventions anytime oh, soon. Oh. Yeah. Just to see if, like, he's going to Baltimore. Hey, Mike, if you're listening, because I know you will be, if you're going to Baltimore Comic Con, let us know, September 17th and 18th, so we can... We can definitely uh, can meet up with you, you say hello. and jump in front of the line because we're special. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. That's Out of our way. I want to get the fir- I want to get the first sketch. I want my Moon Knight sketch. I was when I was asking him about JSA. I was just so that that shot of the JSA that he did for that cover was so good, and to hear him, I knew ahead of time that he wasn't uh, a superhero artist per se. You know what I mean? Like that's he enjoys right. the other aspects of superheroes right. than just the full out cape and tights and and. Uh, I was kind of disappointed because I I think he'd be really great with like a, a mini series or a flashback. I, I, I could see a little that. heartbreaking when he shows yeah. a dry book and <laughs> dry. I was like, Whoa. Oh, yeah, that's. But I mean, yeah, that's not his bag, baby. So that's, you know, that's, that's right. That's I fun. mean, you know, everybody's got their own motivations, and right. and you know, just the stuff in Cap. You know, I could tell that he had mm-hmm. an interest in World War Two. Well, yeah, that's what caught my eye immediately. It was like whoever is drawing because again, I hadn't heard of his name until I read the Cap, and and I looked at, it, I just went. This guy is having fun drawing this because yeah. it's so good that if he wasn't having fun, then he has the most, more patience than anyone in the world because yeah, I, yeah. I loved it you immediately. Can't, you can't do the work like that unless you're interested in what you're doing. I mean, he well, even has like the invader, the old, you know, yeah. the old invader, yeah. World War II heroes. It, like, it surprised oh, no. me when I was reading because I swear one of the first issues that he did, I didn't read closely enough who the artist was or saw that he had done like the panels, those panels, and flipping through the book as I'm reading and I came across, I was like, oh. Oh, this is so nice! And I went back. And, yeah, it is him. And I went back and started reading more. And because oh. I mean, I watch all of the, the the stuff on the History Channel and, and Discovery Channel on World War Two. Anytime something's on there, yeah. I catch it. And and watching all that stuff and seeing those panels in that book—that's exactly what it's like. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, it's it's like watch, yeah, it's like watching Band of Brothers. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. <laughs> or, or you know, um, it's very Saving Private Ryan. The yeah. Busted out. Even though it's new, all it's all that feel and all that look and and very detail oriented. Like he said about. You know, maybe I spend too much time and stuff, but the detail shows, and it makes the difference. It makes it that much more realistic, and and uh, and I don't know if that's you know, it seems like that's kind of an approach he puts to, towards these right. his things that he likes the realistic look, um, which is something that I like. So it's a really enjoyable. For I am me. I am very very excited to hear them say that. Uh, they're going to have some fun with Daredevil and a little, yeah. you know, bring yeah. the superhero back. I yeah. mean, I again, I'm one of the biggest fans of the Bendis run, and and I and I love Bendis's pacing. And if he wrote Daredevil for another 20 years, I wouldn't get tired of it. But if these new guys are going to do something a little different, that can be exciting too. And you know, I would love to see Daredevil swinging around and kicking some ass. Yeah. And you know, probably there there'll some be of a that. Spider-Man cameo because they seem to always end sure. up teaming up right. sooner or later. And mm-hmm. you know, that'll just be fun again. Now that's why when I said to him, I, de- I definitely am more enthused about his run on Daredevil now because of that fact. Because it's again, I don't put down what Malev and Bendis are doing. I think they're doing a phenomenal job. However. I do see that, especially when it led up to like 49 and 50 with him battling Bullseye and Kingpin. Um, I don't know, you know, they kind of you kind of expected something, and, and I kind of felt a little left down. I didn't think that the action and the dramatism of the fights were were that great. Um, they weren't bad. It's not they were drawn bad. It just right. I didn't know. I get that feel of it. I didn't get a, like an impactful battle. Like this is really adventurous and and, and right. dynamic. And yeah. and I feel just by looking at a little bit of the stuff that he did in that what if uh, Karen Page had lived when you see like he you know retold some of the story of Guardian Devil and and you see those pages it, it's cool I mean it, I get that feel of action from it and and I can see where he gets the influence you know from the from Dave Mazzuchelli and such and and I'm very much looking forward to it so he has sort of a style that mimics I shouldn't say mimics that's that's a wrong thing to say similar to he said in the same art style. how did he put, he said something like it's in the same vein or something like right. that. right yeah. it's similar i mean Sim- there's yeah. similarities between their styles i don't like to say they're identical or they right. mimic each other right um <clears throat> so there is a similarity between what malev draws and and what he will be drawing but i think his sense of realism and his uh dramaticism will be uh, a definite refreshing addition to his artwork so i mean you're going to get something new out of it yeah. than just a yeah Another guy who looks like Malev. Right. Yeah, I always thought Malev did well with the, the quiet, just you know, mm-hmm. uh, little you know talking stories, which you know Bendis has been telling these last couple of story arcs. Just you know, I mean, his last story arc was basically just you know, 
group of six people sitting around talking hate, each right? telling the same story but in different you viewpoints. know different different viewpoints and it just it works and I kind of agree with Kevin when you know with those bigger issues where there was big battle scenes I thought it didn't work quite as well I just I think Malev works better on the small stories you know small character you know although, dialogue al- driven stories although the golden age had some action in it and that was very good yeah, yeah. that was just I was just going to add his style ha- and his his and that's what Mike had said that he's changed since he started on Daredevil, and I can definitely see that. I mean, even in the last part of the story arc in in, uh, in Decalogue, mm-hmm. um, the action there, as well as what was in Golden Age, was much different than what I saw back in 49 and 50 mm-hmm. with uh, the Bullseye and the King of Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. Um, so it, you definitely see a growth in what Malev, in his artwork, and you can definitely see um, him pushing the boundaries of himself and, and, and always striving to do more, and you can even see more of that on the next arc of daredevil with the covers and him starting to papers yeah with him starting to expand into doing you know more of the using the paint program Mm -hmm. um and and getting a a whole different look to his style um so he's constantly a a work in progress so to speak and that's that's neat two things that uh michael lark said that i that caught my attention one of them where he said he i forget quite i forget how exactly he worded it but he said something like you know he wants to make kingpin back into this humongous man right. and i don't know mm-hmm. if that was something he wished or he wants or something that, that sound you know what i mean like uh, you know because i'm it sure he doesn't like he's want to gonna do it, it. sounds like yeah, he's gonna do it I mean. yeah it'll just be his interpretation right, right. kingpin in but it'll be back to more of the mazzicelli right. and and the older style of how king yeah, well, is right. which is i mean it was just he was so he was gargantuan yeah. you know mm-hmm. I mean, he's supposed to be 400 pounds or something, but right. he's not 800 pounds. Isn't and it? not that that's giving away any kind of spoilers, but that's kind of, in, you know, that might a little insight into maybe what the next story he's doing. Or well, you're going to get some of that, I think, in the, in the Murdoch papers. Yeah, I think that's what that story is about right. um, with Kingpin coming back and things right. like that. So you're going to get... Especially that first cover that they just... Yeah. The other thing he mentioned that uh, I thought was, you know, very just put very well was when he said... He believes that single issues and trades, they need to live side by side, basically. Or they should live side by side. Yeah, definitely. And I one agree. should never replace the other. Right. And trade should be used as a way to help a series as opposed to, you know, uh, And I think that's happened said. in the industry. Yeah. I think it really has helped the industry quite a bit. Um, and I'm, I'm just like him. Like, I'll buy issues when there's stuff I want to read right. and don't want to wait. And, of course, it's a lot of it with DC because of them, with their the way they drag their feet putting their trade system out. But... Um, I feel that the trade system has added so much to the industry mm-hmm. with being able to market it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, different stores. In different stores that they'll carry the trades. They don't want to carry single Better issues. And do, you know what I mean? So it's, I think it's very uh, added very much to the industry. I think it's really helped, and, and it's shown in the, in the sales figures. And I stuff. like that single issues, you know, when they make these announcements of how many issues, it, it does kind of help to show that there is an increase, and hopefully that means – an increase in interest and readership as well. Like, you know, you can kind of gauge single issues more than you can the trade, um, unless it's something like Sandman that goes through five, six, eight printings, and mm-hmm. Preacher there's that, that goes through multiple um, printings. So it's kind of nice that, you know, we are – that is slowly climbing. You know, it was 100,000, then 200,000. Now we're getting up to like 236,000, you know. So that's kind of nice that – Hopefully those issues aren't all sitting somewhere that we are getting more readers. Um, but he's definitely right in saying that the trade, the market share in the trade, is the money is, is it's you know it's getting bigger every every month, and so are issues, especially during this time. I mean, both companies are yeah. are experiencing a jump in in market share. Well, and, if you just if you just look at the numbers, <clears throat> and you know that in the forties, and uh, I, maybe even into the fifties, where there were you know, tens of millions of copies of of some of some uh, issues being sold. And the population in the United States was much less than it is now. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you do the math, you know, the potential is there. I mean, obviously TV and movies have replaced a lot of the time that people spent right. reading. And the video internet games. and video, video games. games, yeah. But, but, you know, and maybe we won't ever see anything selling 10 million copies again, which is fine. But if we could see consistent 500,000 numbers on, you know, your yeah. top 20 or 30 yeah. books... Well, that would be awesome. Yeah, and yeah. so it's there, and it can be done if they just mm-hmm. keep the right. machine rolling and, and keep improving. And, and right. yeah. I thought it was quite interesting that he said that that was one of the things that made him sign an exclusive deal with Marvel. Well, I had or, read that in another interview that one of the reasons why Brubaker and Lark 
left DC was because that they feel they weren't being supported mm-hmm. in the books yeah. that they were doing. So and, that and, you know, and I can understand that. You know, if you're if you're putting your your heart and soul into something right. and and you don't see the company promoting it and 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 supporting it, well then you know what's the sense? There's yeah, also money in trades. Yeah, well, and he, he's right. I mean. You, uh, I think they're missing out. I really yeah, do. Yeah, Go- Gotham Central has one trade out, as far as I know. I could mm-hmm. be wrong on that. They could have come out with the second one most re- recently. But still, there was only one trade out for the longest time. And, you know, that's that's a book that if they want the people to get on it, they've got to bring out more than one trade. Right. Um, it's like TV and and, and uh, syndication. They they make money on, you know, the creators themselves get royalties from trade. So right. I can, I can certainly see if somebody hands you a contract and you know Marvel's going to be put out, putting out those Daredevil oh, trades in hard covers and soft covers. So he's, there's added money in that as well. Yeah, like so an, or or, or yeah. DVD. You were talking about you know, TV with syndication right. or right. DVD right. deal. You know, they bring them all out in a DVD and suddenly, I mean, Family Guy... You know, they got a new sh- new show after the DVDs came out, Serenity, because mm-hmm. their DVD sales were so big. Now there's a movie coming out. Right. So there is, you know, there's trade paperbacks. There is a place for them. I'm not. Oh, sure. Yeah, because I'd love to read the Brubaker and Rucka, you know, Gotham Central with Michael Lark on it, but it's not out there. Yeah, another, Everyone I, I, keeps, another you really know, great. just talking about it on the boards. are like, read, read that Gotham Central. I'm picking read. up my first Gotham Central single issue only because the Teen Titans are crossing over. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, I, I mean, unfortunately, you're probably going to see a spike in that because of that crossover. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't, you know. So I'll, I'll get that at least. And, and I did another good one and while we're throwing out good stuff for other people. Um, Ed Brubaker, I really enjoyed his run on Catwoman. It was really, oh, yeah, he yeah, did yeah. a whole lot of that. really good stuff on Catwoman. So if you like what he's doing on Cap right now, yeah, I know everybody's going, damn it, no more money out of my wallet. But uh, go find those Catwoman back issues they were really good or some he did one whole run where the catwoman just basically drove around the dc universe visiting different cities visit different heroes and it was just that was one of the my favorite runs in that book better than the movie <laughs> <laughs> what what movie i pretend there isn't a movie uh-oh thank you you can never you can escape you can you never can escape you can, you can never go home either <laughs> you can never go home <laughs> Home, I, I have, have no, no home. home. Hunted, despised. despised. That's your Ed Wood <laughs> moment of the day. Pull the string. <laughs> Pull the strings. What? What are you saying? <laughs> Karloff was he called? Karloff. The limey cocksucker can fit this man my shit. Oh. Karloff. <laughs> oh, we should have worn Michael Lark. D- d- quick, don't let your family listen oh, to this. Yeah. <laughs> Oops! Yeah. Stop now, right. or stop five seconds ago. <laughs> we uh, we got to stump the Rios from Chris Seifert, uh, and actually he has quite a long email before the stump the Rios, so we have to do at least one listener email. Sure. This episode, so so might as well be two it. birds, one stone. Gentlemen, I write to you again with more stump the Rios questions, but rather than recommending another book in this email, I have an issue that I would enjoy hearing discussed by your group. Oh. Oh boy. Well, we'll have to say, we have to depending on what it is, write we'll this have to down. Say. Yeah. The issue that I would like to hear discussed is that of writers, one would assume at the behest of publishers, writing with the goal in mind of producing a trade rather than delivering a good monthly issue. Well, actually, we just got some insight into that from, mm-hmm. from Michael Lark. Some kind of uh, answered there. Uh, allow me to elaborate. This past weekend, I borrowed Ultimate Fantastic Four issues 1 through 20 from a friend. Though I had noticed this before, it was glaringly evident to me while reading this run. I know that several of you guys have mentioned that you were really enjoying the title, but I found it to be incredibly drawn out, to the point that I felt I was reading filler designed to stretch out into a six-issue trade rather than a 22-page comic. I know that comparing the writing of today with the first issues of the original series is often an exercise in futility, but it took three issues of Ultimate FF to see any of the four with powers. It wasn't until six issues that they beat the Mole Man, This is stuff that was accomplished in one issue of the original series. With each Ultimate title, I have enjoyed the twist that they put on well-established characters, making them new again. But how can it possibly take six issues to tell the Doom storyline, where all that happens is Doom sends robotic bugs to the Baxter building and the FF fly to Copenhagen to confront him? Six issues! That took nearly an entire issue just discussing... they They took nearly an entire issue just discussing the Fantastic Car. At the start of the end zone storyline, there were six pages in a row of basically nothing but splash pages showing the shuttle and the gate that would produce the the hole to the end zone. 
No dialogue, no writing, just five pictures on six pages. While the pictures looked cool, it just screamed of filling pages with pinups because there isn't enough real material. Anyway, I've noticed this in other books, recent issues of Daredevil, Ultimate X-Men, and so on. I turn the last page of the book and think to myself, what exactly happened in the 20 plus, page, 20 plus pages that I just read? Am I merely remembering the old 80s and 90s days more fondly than they deserve? It just seems that the classic three-stage story arc has been stretched to fit more issues without adding anything to the story. Well, we'll we will go back to that. Yeah, and yeah. we, you know, okay. And so, he's certainly given his side of it. So yeah. Now on to stump the Rios. Question number one: Jigsaw, one of the Punisher's arch enemies, is so known because the Punisher threw him face first through a glass window, thus leaving his face looking like a jigsaw puzzle. Years later, he had plastic surgery that completely fixed his face. In the same issue, while the Punisher was fighting with Batman, Jigsaw's face was shredded once again. This time, who was responsible? Batman. <laughs> I don't know. Batman. <laughs> and he had a 50-50 shot. <laughs> oh, Punisher again. The Punisher again, this time with a grenade. All right. <laughs> Nothing like getting your face fixed and having it blown up in the same, same That's time. Right. <laughs> it was a grenade, no less. Yes. Wow. Question two. In V for Vendetta, oh. what is the name of the first head of a government branch to be killed by V? I don't know. George Bush. <laughs> That's wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Almond at the finger. Uh-oh. Didn't you just read that? No, I haven't read it yet. <gasps> That's why I, I know. Uh oh! All right, over question two. three. Over dun, two. Dun, dun. Did he say that he already s- sent stump the? Re- what are you doing sending more? If you, I don't maybe know. he I didn't. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't. Yeah, maybe he didn't. Maybe didn't. show notes. Or maybe he didn't read them either. In Sandman: Endless Night, in oh. Dream Story, what is the name of Dream's lover, who he loses by the end of the story? Oh, I didn't read that either. Um. <sighs> I read it, but I don't remember. Yeah, it. there is a lover that I do know. That it's, it's that African queen, but I don't think... Or African, she's a... Uh, na- uh, Take I, a shot. Take a shot. Um, I'm going to... S- I don't know. Courtney Love. I, have oh. oh. I thought you had at least... <laughs> Kilala of the Glow. Oh, that's what you were going to say, right? Fairy. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. She's a fairy. Oh. Oh, you've been stumped. The Rio's yeah. Lambasted, been... no And that lamb. first question, 50-50... Over oh, three. Oh, well, you picked the wrong one. Yeah. No. And what are you doing giving away V as a prize if you haven't read it? Uh, are you waiting? Jeez. Oh, so you, you know? should have used a high five eight ball for that 50-50 <laughs> question. Go ahead, try it. See what. Try it. Okay, let me see. Uh, is did it Batman? Did did Batman ruin his face or did Punisher ruin Jigsaw's face? Uh, or no, I guess I have to ask. To ask was it Batman? Question. The high five design ball says. Absolutely. See, you can't trust that thing. <laughs> Well, speaking so of, I didn't read it either, so that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of high five, who did? Speaking of high five, I read, I read Chris Seifert did. I read one of them. I did. One of those crossovers. Speaking of high five, speaking, speaking of high, of high five. five. Oh crap! Now I don't have. Are the... you switching to stereo now? Or are you no longer? Yes. Okay. Now he's oh, mono. I can't. Tape to tape. I can't do this now. So, I'll see, write it down yeah. next time. No, I, yeah, I don't have the proper information. In front of me. Proper modulation. Oh, but you can say that... Uh, I, well, yes, Brian, uh, actually, I can click away here while we're doing this, and it'll come up. Click away, um, click away, click away. Uh, if I can talk and type at the same time. <laughs> this should be fun. Do you want some gum? Brian <laughs> Miller what of Hi-Fi it, Design, in his interview with us, challenged the audience to donate uh, to the next, the first five people after his interview that donated at least $20... To my bike ride, would uh, he would send a whole bunch of uh, High stuff to swag. some some signed swag. comics, some swag, whatever. Sure. And uh, within 24 hours of that episode airing, more than five people uh-huh. uh, sent in at least twenty dollar donations. Oh, all right, so cool! Uh, it, which is just awesome. And oh, so there are a few people that we need. There are three people who we need to get uh, their addresses. You need to email us uh, your address so that he can send you out your stuff. So the people I need here are the address for Sean Anderson, James McNally, 
and Bradley Schwartz. If you are listening, please send your mailing address to comicgeekspeak at gmail.com and I will forward that off to Brian and then he can send you your stuff. And I really appreciate it. My goal has been topped. I'm now over a thousand dollars. I think I'm at a thousand thirty dollars. People just keep donating. It's Damn. It's, it's, it's incredible. So I really thank everyone and uh hopefully you know I will make every single mile of that 150. I can't. I, I have no choice. If I'm dying, I'm going to keep pedaling until I cross. Push me. Mile. Push me. <laughs> make sure you teach me how to uh, start this whole garage band thing before you do it, just in case yeah. if you do die. <laughs> <laughs> if I keel over from exhaustion. So, so send me, again, uh, Sean Anderson, James McNally, and Bradley Schwartz. Send me your address. Here's the dollar I owe for Stump the Rios. Uh, Dun, dun, and dun. Chris, send us your address now, your snail mail address, because now we have to send you a prize. Right. I'm going to make Peter send you a prize. I will. That's a fine. pint of well, his blood got, or you something. You got change right there. Um, so, yeah. I'm good. All right. Got you. Anything yeah. else? Anybody has anything to say? No. Those were some fun mm-hmm. discussions. Past two epi- podcasts, we had some fun interviews. Yeah. So. We'll just remind everyone of our September Book of the Month Club selection is Fables Volume 1. Uh, you can get that at InStockTrades.com for 40% off. So go pick it up if you would like. And uh, who, did we figure out who the artist was? It's not Mark Buckingham. It's not Buckingham. Mark Buckingham. It was uh, – I we I looked at it after, <laughs> and I can, honestly cannot remember it, but it was right. not Mark, Mark Buckingham. But it's still definitely worth picking up yes. even if you're a Mark yes. Buckingham fan because then you'll want to read it, and then you want to read the ones he actually did because he has done some since. Cool. Excellent. All right, everyone. I, uh, I'm, I'm sitting here going, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, he's over. yawning. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm boring you. He's the man at the board with the controls. <laughs> what do I do now? I need to cue up the music. <laughs> Land the silly, plane. Silly, silly me. If you would like to send us an email, send it to comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. And please visit our blog at comicgeekspeak.blogspot.com. If you would like to hear about other comic podcasts, you can check them out at comicspodcast.com. A uh, big thanks to Bob at GameCircuit.net for hosting all of the show, all of the files. Please vote for us at Podcast Alley and subscribe to us using iTunes. And if you would like, what, what's up, Peter? Uh, I was going to make a push to vote for Podcast Alley because September is here. So definitely this is the time to attack the voting right away, right in the beginning of the month. Let us get up there past 50, 40, wherever we can get. Yeah. And uh, if you would like a T-shirt... We sell them on our blog. It's ten dollars. That includes shipping. So, uh, you know, geek out with all your friends and wear the t-shirt. Uh, and uh, uh, we are brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. See you next time. Bye. Everybody.